So I have to say, the first time I met Sarah and Greg, it, it must have been, oh God, 12 years. It was a long time ago. And, and the, the landscape of what we had to kind of offer, nine, it was a long time ago. But the landscape um, of what we had to offer was, was so different back then in, in a bad way. I mean, all of the things that we're hearing, you know, from you guys that, oh, we need more collaboration, we need people to talk. Well, that's actually happening, as Miguel said earlier today. It really is now, uh, but, it, but it wasn't then. Um, and I really have to thank, you know, everything that Sarah has done to bring um, the patient community and the, the science community together. Um, and, and I have to thank Kira OM for what they're doing, because I think um, you are building this community. Everyone here is a part of it, and we are really making progress. So, you know, I, I like to um, st start off some talks about um, kind of looking at the progress we've made in skin melanoma. And, and I think other folks have alluded to this, but um, when I started treating cutaneous melanoma 10 years or in 2004, um, and we saw patients with metastases, um, you, you know, what we had to offer then was, well, you know, let, let's, let's give you a medicine, let's see how much time we can get. But, but the goal was not really cure. In reality, we wanted that, but it was so uncommon, um, and and you know that was just the reality of 2004. And fast forward to today, when I see a patient with skin, when we see patients with cutaneous melanoma, um, it has with metastatic disease to the brain, liver, or wherever, um, it's completely different. The goal is cure, um, and you know we're not curing 100% of patients, um, but we're we're curing you know 30, 40% of people um, with disease to the brain, lungs, liver. Uh, and that's, that's amazing. In 10 years, that's happened, okay? Um, and so, although all of us, you know, want um, us to be in a better place for uveal melanoma than where we are today, um, it's better than where it was, um, and I really do believe that we'll be able to replicate what we did for cutaneous in this disease, okay? Uh, we just have to do it faster, right? So I, I do a lot of um, consulting and work with a lot of drug companies, so... Um, <clears throat> Those are there. So what I wanted to do was was kind of um, try to um, put in graphic form the way I think about the, the treatment journey uh, for patients because it's really really confusing. Um, and from a, a kind of clinician perspective, the way I think about this is well, we have to factor in a lot of things to figure out what the right treatment is. And and one is of course looking at the patient. Um, you know, what is just the general health status? What are the other comorbidities? What do the labs look like? Um, what are the patient preferences for treatment? What are their goals? Uh, we have to take all of that into account. Um, I highlight here, since this is a clinical trial talk, um, that um, we're oftentimes getting um, something called HLA testing done, um, which is just um, really your tissue type. If you get an organ transplant, um, you have to like get get mats for uh, your your tissue type to make sure your body doesn't reject it. Um, this is becoming important for some of the new immunotherapies that we're doing. So it's it's kind of information that we want in our back pocket. Um, we also take into account um, the patient's individual disease. Um, you know, Dr. Eshelman was talking about if you look at the liver, is the disease kind of discrete nodules or is it really infiltrative? Um, you know, and so we take things like that into account. Or what's the pace of the disease? Is it growing really fast or is it maybe a little bit slower? Is it just in the liver or is it outside, right? So these are factors that we have to take into account. And then I, again, highlight in red, we do take into account, um, at least from a research perspective, the molecular and genetic characteristics. And Dr. Orloff will go into kind of how, how we kind of do that. And we're also looking at, at this thing called PRAME. Um, in kind of an investigational um, standpoint in terms of does that help um, predict what the risk of the you know, disease being bad is or are there treatment modalities we can think about. Um, and then we also have to look at the resources available too. Um, I, I, you know, a, a lot of people do um, travel to um, like referral centers, to Jefferson or, or wherever, um, and, that, and that's, I, th I think that's really important. But you know, I, God, ideally there was something you could do in your, your own hospital or someplace, so you wouldn't have to travel. Um, but so we do take that into account. What's, what's available closer to home? And we look at all of that and then we make a treatment recommendation. So in terms of the treatment recommendations, you know, how do I broadly think about these? Um, and this is whether we're talking about clinical trials or whether we're talking about standard therapy. And I kind of divide it in my head, I think we do the same into, um, 
what we call these local regional therapies. These are all the things that Dr. Eshelman was talking about, all these embolizations and um, you know, chemoembolization and Delcath stuff. Um, should we be considering that um, sort of therapy? Um, the second kind of big category are these systemic therapies. That is, should we be considering medicines that we give by vein or pills? Um, now, those are not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? We can do both at the same time, right? And so we think, is that appropriate? Um, and then there are some cases where, you know, maybe patients really just want us to help them feel as good as possible for as long as possible without doing an active anti-cancer therapy, right? Uh, um, again, patient preferences, what do you guys want? Um, when we think about the clinical trials, and just, just to go back, for all of these, there's some standard treatments that we can do, right? Um, the problem with uvula, as you know, is that we don't have um, any standard therapies that we know meaningfully help most people with this disease. Okay, if we did, that's what we would do up front. And so because we don't have that, um, you know, if there is a good clinical trial available that gives you access to something novel, that's looking promising in some, you know, small group of patients or in the laboratory or whatnot, um, that's, that's definitely something that, that we, we encourage. It's the only way we're going to move the field forward, okay? Um, and so in terms of systemic treatments, you guys good? So for, feel free to ask questions on the way if I get confusing. In terms of systemic treatments, the way I kind of um, think about the trials that we're developing and working on now, I, I broadly put them into three buckets, okay? Um, the first bucket are what we call genetically um, driven diseases or targeted therapies. Okay, and Dr. Orloff is going to talk about that. Um, yeah, when, when I think about just targeted therapies and these pathways, I, I like to think about it like like the subway because you know I live in New York and so we're always on the subway. Um, and there are all these like pathways in the cancer cell um, that have to be turned on or turned off um, very precisely. Okay. Um, kind of like the signals at the subway stations, right? You need the red signal or the, the green signal at the right time. Otherwise, you get a crash. Something bad happens. And um, in some cancers, including uvula melanoma, the signals are messed up. And so the question is, can we um, use a drug to fix that? And, and those are some of the targeted therapies that we talk about. The second broad category um, I, I talk about are these epigenetic therapies. And so Dr. Orloff kind of mentioned that. What, what, what are epigenetics? Well, genetic alterations or genetic mutations are problems or mutations or problems right in the DNA, okay? And so we see that in some cancers, including uveal. Um, but there's just actually very few genetic mutations in, in uveal melanoma. Um, but um, despite the fact that we don't have a whole ton of mutations, um, the genes might be turned on or turned off inappropriately. Uh, and that is due to these what we call epigenetic abnormalities. And so there are treatments that we can do to try to fix that. And then lastly, um, you've all seen commercials for Keytruda and Opdivo and all of those things. And, and clearly, immunotherapy has, uh, without a doubt, revolutionized the way we, we think about cancer in general. Okay. And so what I want to focus the rest of the talk uh, on today is um, some of the investigational strategies in terms of immunotherapies we're doing in this disease. This slide's the most confusing one that I'm going to show you, I promise. OK? <laughs> but um, when we think about how these immunotherapies work that you see the commercials for, these, these checkpoint inhibitors, really, in short, they function by hyperactivating the immune system. OK? For a cancer to grow, um, it has to be able to evade the immune system, right? Otherwise, it'll die. It'll just, you know, it just won't be able to grow. Um, and it turns out that the cancer has developed a lot of different ways to avoid the immune system. Um, I think I'll just talk about, you know, when you look at like nivolumab, Opdivo, or Ketru, the, those, those are the TV commercials you see all the time. Um, one of the ways that cancers frequently evade the immune system is by, let's say this is the cancer cell, it just studs itself with all these proteins called PDL1. And so even if an immune cell is smart enough to kind of get in the area of the cancer, it touches that PDL1 shield and, and the immune cell dies. Okay? So what Opdivo does, Keytruda, drugs like that, it basically takes that shield away from the cancer. And if we do that, um, for instance, in, in skin melanoma, um, this is a patient with, again, cutaneous, but a big, you know, tumor in the liver. Is that showing up? big tumor in the liver, and just after a few months, it shrinks down to that. 
And then sometimes you use you know, combination immunotherapies that are more aggressive, and this is another skin melanoma patient, all these soft tissue lesions and stuff, and again, after a few months, it all goes away. Okay, So the problem is, um, well, one thing is that can work um, in uveal melanoma. Okay, It's just much less common. Okay, um, And so this is, this is actually a patient treated in um, Paris at the Institut Curie. And um, this was actually a really big publication in a really good journal. Um, but this was a patient with a uveal melanoma, um, bad genetics. So she had that BAP1 mutation, uh, monosomy 3. Um, uh, and uh, she ultimately, after nucleation, developed a spot in the liver, a small spot in the lung, a small spot in the bone, and some little soft tissue lesions. Um, of the 41 patients um, they treated, with immunotherapy in Paris, this was the only patient who did well. Um, but she did really well. The cancer completely went away, right? It, this, this is actually a response in the bone. Uh, the soft tissue things are a little bit hit or miss. Um, but this patient, you know, it's, it's really a near complete response to pembrolizumab, ongoing durable. And so someone asked in the other se session, it was a really great question, why don't we look at the patients who do really well and the patients who don't do well? and figure out what the difference is. So here they did that. And in this patient, um, they found that there was a mutation in the gene called MBD4. You don't have to remember that, but it's just, it's just a, a mutation that you don't find very often in uveal melanoma. Um, but that mutation makes you more responsive okay, to, to immunotherapy. So that's what happened here. And so for a lot of us, um, when we see patients uh, with uveal melanoma or other diseases, we talk about doing all these genetic tests and so forth things like foundation medicine you might have heard about. Um, we do that not because it's, it's likely we'll find something unexpected in uveal, because we almost always find the same thing, but rarely we will find something that might say, wow, we should really think about this specifically. Um, and so that's something that for you guys as patients, I would think about asking your physicians. It's like, have we done some big, broad you know, gene sequencing panel? Now, that doesn't happen all the time. Oh, this is a little bit confusing. This is the last confusing one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, th so those responses don't f happen as frequently as we want in uveal melanoma. There are a few reasons. One is um, because um, with these immunotherapies, it seems that cancers that have a lot of mutations, um, a lot of abnormalities that the immune system can recognize, those are the ones, like skin melanoma there, um, that respond really well to these immunotherapies. Um, but if you look, uveal melanoma has, you know, really the fewest number of mutations of any cancer. Um, and that, that is kind of corresponding to the relatively low likelihood of benefit to these immunotherapies that we see. Um, um, this is actually work from Jefferson looking at this thing called PDL1, just looking at how much of that PDL1 protein is, is on uveal melanoma. And it just turns out it's, at least in metastases, it's, it's really few. Um, and the more PDL1 you have, the better these treatments work. You know, so there, there are a few reasons why uh, we think that these treatments might not do well in general. Um, and so you know, when our hands are forced um, for our patients with uveal melanoma, if, if I don't have a good clinical trial, um, um, you know, if, if we want to do immunotherapy, I, I'd be curious to see what you guys do. But if I need to do that, then I tend to do more aggressive immunotherapy with this combination. Um, and, th and that also can work. This was actually a patient of mine, 52-year-old, um, and she had a, you know, a, a bad uveal melanoma. We treated her with a, a bunch of prior therapies. And this is the PET scan um, before we started this immunotherapy. All these white spots are like bits of cancer. It's all over, right? And so we treated her with combination immunotherapy. So in this case, it was nivolumab or Optivo plus this thing called Yervoy. And after three months, it almost all went away. Um, and because she developed side effects, we actually didn't treat her anymore. We just kind of watched. Um, and I saw her last in January, which would have put her at about uh, probably 14 months um, from here. Um, and, and the scans are still completely clean. OK? So um, you know, I guess Sarah was saying, you know, someone here is going to be the first one um, that, that we're going to cure. I think we're, all, we're already doing it. Okay. I, well, I want more of you guys to be the, right? But it's, it's happening, okay? It's just not happening as much as we want it to. Um, so in terms of trials, 
Um, for the patients who are at high risk of recurrence, so for the patients who are like um, you know, monosomy 3 or GEP class 2, um, one of the issues is, is there anything that we can do to help reduce the risk of this coming back? I don't know if you're going to talk about adjuvant stuff, um, but, but that's what these um, adjuvant therapies are supposed to be. Can we give you a medicine after plaque or after nucleation to reduce the likelihood that this comes back? Um, there are not enough of those trials um, because, to be honest, we don't have enough good ideas, right? We don't have great, great leads. Um, but because of what we've seen with combination immunotherapy in some cases, um, there, is, there is an ongoing trial of combination immunotherapy for high-risk uh, patients. Okay, so that's just something to, to think about. Um, when, we, when we do these um, checkpoint inhibitors, or these immunotherapies, um, although they can work really well, they also can cause a lot of side effects. Um, and this, I might leave more for questions, but it's just something to be aware that, um, that if we're doing this, you have to be watched really closely for side effects. You can have issues with the skin and the bowels and the hormone glands and the liver, the nerves, the heart. Um, so, like everything, everything. Um, so, you know, these, these things do come at, at some kind of risk, manageable, but you just have to be careful. Um, there are two other kind of immunotherapies uh, that are being studied that I just wanted to call out. Um, one is something called adoptive T cell therapy, okay? Um, and this, this is a type of therapy which is it's really interesting, initially developed at the um, NIH, and it's now being done at multiple centers around the country, like Pittsburgh and MD Anderson and, and other centers. Um, but here the concept is, you know, what if we can take the immune cells that, that have been smart enough to hone into the tumor, right? Um, just pull those out and then grow them and infuse a lot of them back into you. Will that work? Okay. Um, and so for, for this, basically what happens is um, you have a piece of your tumor cut out, um, and, then, and then in the lab they, they actually do that. They take out the immune cells and they grow them. Uh, and if those immune cells we think are good to attack the tumor, um, then you get this, some chemotherapy, maybe some radiation, and then they infuse the cells back. Um, and this, this sort of um, um, therapy has been um, tested specifically in uveal melanoma. There's only one study uh, that's been reported that's done this, and this was done by Udai Kamula when he was at the NIH. He's now at Pittsburgh. Um, and, you know, again, this response rate, this thing here, it's what we call a waterfall plot. If the bar goes, each bar is a patient. If the bar goes down, the tumor shrank. If the bar goes up, the tumor grew. Um, and we're just used to seeing the tumor growing usually. So this sort of like pattern of the waterfall plot is, is it's promising. Um, and, and some patients had long lasting durable responses. This is preliminary, but I think it's something that I want you guys to kind of think about and kind of you can ask your oncologists about and so forth, okay? It's a, you know, it's a logistically tough treatment, but it's, it's something to think about. Um, and the other thing that Dr. Eshelman alluded to is this um, IMC GP100 drug. I call this out because um, in this disease, it's very uncommon that we get a drug um, that, um, that is looking promising enough to take into what we call registration intent clinical trials. Okay, that is a clinical trial is designed to get it FDA approved, right? These are the big clinical trials, and this is the only drug for uveal melanoma that's in that stage, okay? Um, so the drug itself, it looks like this. It, it basically has two halves. Um, this top half is, um, it's actually um, kind of an optimized immune cell receptor. It's an optimized T cell receptor that basically it just binds really, really tightly to uveal melanoma cells, okay? So it just goes to wherever the uveal melanoma is and binds to it. And the other end just um, takes any immune cells that are in that area and brings it in closer proximity to the tumor cell. Um, and by doing that, um, you can get tumor cell death, okay? Um, and based on um, kind of you know, relatively small numbers of patients that we've reported on a few times now, so it's 35 patients. If you look at how they've done compared to um, what we'd expect, uh, it was much, much better, okay? Um, and, and that's led to um, basically two um, clinical trials that have been developed, again, to get this drug FDA approved. Um, this trial um, is, is a study for patients who've had prior treatments for um, metastatic uveal melanoma, um, and all of those patients um, get the IMC GP100 drug. Um, and um, this, this trial has actually completed accrual already, 
okay? And they're gonna be these interim looks, and, um, but nothing's uh, been reported yet, okay? Um, the only ongoing trial for this study, and this is where I get tomatoes thrown at me, okay? But I'll tell you why. But this, this study is for patients who have not had prior systemic therapy uh, for the disease. Um, oh, and just one thing to point out, for this drug, you have to have a certain HLA type. Okay, so that's where that HLA testing comes into to play. You have to be HLA AO201 positive. About 40 to 50% of Caucasians in the US have that, okay? Um, but if, if you have that, then on this study, um, of every three patients, two are gonna be randomized. You know what you're randomized to, but two are randomized to the immunocore drug. One patient is randomized to investigator choice, okay? All right, um, and, and we can talk about why do we need that study design? Why do we need that randomization? What can we do to reduce the need for that in the future? Okay, but th this is the design. Um, and so, um, you know, going back to, I think, the question for Dr. Eshelman, you know, what, what can we do to figure out why things work and why people are sometimes different? Um, we, we do that by looking at tumor biopsies. That's why we ask on all our trials to do all these liver biopsies. And I know it's torture, but it's really important. It's really, really important. Um, but with this immunocore drug, um, what was shown was, you know, after a few weeks of drug, um, at baseline, the tumor is all kind of blue, which means it's not like immunologically active. It doesn't have any of this PDL1, okay? Um, but after a few weeks, it turns more red. And so that PDL1 thing is more active. Um, and so it's causing some sort of biological effect. And so if we go back to this patient who I showed before, who had just a really remarkable response, um, <clears throat> if we look at what she had before, this is actually even more striking to me. Um, this is a patient who had um, immunotherapy with Yervoy or ipilimumab, the cancer grew. She got pembrolizumab or up the, or, um, um, uh, pembrolizumab with radioembolization for a while, the cancer grew. Then she went on the immunocore drug, and she was on that for a long time, but the cancer grew. And then we go back to the immunotherapy again, but this time in combination, and now it worked. And so this is a patient who had these treatments basically before, and it didn't work, and now it did. And so is there something that happened there? Um, and this is something that um, Dr. Yang, who's in the back, is actually putting a larger series of these kind of interesting cases together for presentation. You know, I, again, it's interesting. I don't know what it means, but I think it's worth looking into more. Um, and so this, this is a slide of all of the active um, immunotherapy trials uh, for uveal melanoma now. The ones in black are ongoing. The ones in red, um, the trials have been held or um, completed accrual. Um, and you can see a lot of these are kind of based upon these checkpoint inhibitors, Pembro, Nevo, Ipi, um, in combination for the most part. Uh, there are some vaccine trials. Um, there are the adopted T cell trials that are ongoing, and then the immunocore trials, okay? There are more that are gonna be coming out targeting things like PRAIM and so forth. And so this list will kind of expand over time. I don't know that this is completely all ex exhaustive, but this is all of the, the immunotherapy trials that I'm aware of. Um, and um, I, I'm sure the slides will be on the website or something if this is helpful. Um, and so I'll, I'll just leave it there. I think, you know, we've come a long way in terms of de developing treatments for this disease or at least designing trials that are, are smart. And I think we'll show, um, it, it will make things better, okay? Um, I think it's important that you guys think about trials, okay? Just because, you know, our, again, our, our proved drugs do not do what we need it to do. Um, and, um, and the collaborative collaboration piece is really critical, and you guys are, you know, the biggest part of that, all right? <laughs> so let me leave it at that, and we'll take questions at, later on. Thanks.